Hello and welcome. Today is December 25th, 2019, and I'm going to try and keep this brief. I want to talk about the gospel that you can find in Colossians chapter 2 and Ephesians chapter 2, and uh, it's the Word Become Flesh gospel. So I'm going to prove to you that it is important that you understand what the incarnation was and what it wasn't. So here I have a book which is called History of the Development of the Doctrine of the Person of Christ, Volumes 1 through 2. And then you see here there's a few different authors. It's an older book from the 1800s, and uh, it's several volumes, and it shows you how the so-called Church Fathers have framed their Christology that um, mounted up to the Council of Chalcedon, which I find is the most significant and outspoken blasphemy that we have seen ever since uh, Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. And all of the churches are built on this dogma, apart from the um, Oriental churches. Now, they have similar problems. I don't have time to get into that. But you see that everything that led up to that is also... Um, uh, the kind of thinking, the philosophy that's actually behind the whole church system. And it proves that they um, speak of pagan doctrines mixed in Christian biblical terminology, and this system that controls the world is actually outspoken, blasphemous, and evil. And I will show you this today. I will show you the true gospel, and maybe first of all, I'll explain to you the difference. The difference is, if we, for example, say that this is the man Jesus Christ, then the uh, pagan church system would claim by the dogma of Chalcedon that there are three invisible persons from eternity past who share one impersonal essence, which they call God, and that one of these three persons called the Logos, or God the Son, came down from heaven, but that prior to doing that, the third person created a body inside the Virgin for nine months, and then on Christmas Eve, and this is how John MacArthur says it in Why Was Jesus Born, 1970, that uh, God the Son came down and assumed this body and this they call an incarnation and then you had a unity in person so this was then the god man and you'll see the whole thought pattern um, behind this where this came from where these church dogmas came from and how it stands opposing to the biblical account which says that the man christ jesus did not exist as a created man in the womb prior to how they term it the incarnation but rather that in the invisible God, you have his word, just like I speak words to you right now. They reflect, um, they're an expression of my own soul. So when the spirit is cultivated, you have the word come out of the depth of the spirit. Just like 1 Corinthians chapter 2 says it, that um, the, the spirit searches the deeps, deep things of God. So the word of God is eternal inside the Father. It's the mirror image inside the Father, just like our hearts are um, reflected in ourselves. <clears throat> and so this word, which is invisible, became flesh at the conception in the womb of the Virgin. So, and then this embryo grew and was born from Mary. So there was no unity of something that was made below and then assumed from above and somehow this unity in person walked around but rather the word of god became flesh when the son of god was conceived so god brought forth a son of man it's actually pretty straightforward and simple and you'll understand why this has to be that way so i'm going to read to you from page 332 ongoing you want to get that book so I have a few passages here that I'm going to read what origin said so it talks about the grand total image of the living person of the God man who includes heaven and earth in himself 
it says, and so these are quotes from Origin. And he is the he laid the groundwork for the Trinity dogma and also for the hypostatic union. He's also regarded as the greatest and the brightest of theologians, even though the Roman Catholic Church excommunicated him after his death. So he says about Jesus, we can no longer say that there was no darkness in him. And he says that that is because he was made sin for us. So he claims that there was darkness in Jesus. He says his soul was troubled and shaken and according to Zechariah he put on unclean garments. So uh, he refers to uh, Zechariah and the high priest uh, Yeshua um, and yeah, says that Jesus put on unclean garments just like Yeshua the high priest. He says, we can only say of the Father, in him is no darkness. His flesh, meaning Jesus' flesh, is also termed sin. For he came in the form of sinful flesh. So when the Bible says in Romans 8 verse 3 that Jesus came in the resemblance of sinful flesh, it means that he became flesh but was not sinful flesh so he didn't take it out of Mary but he resembled it meaning his flesh was similar to it but it wasn't sinful so there was no sin in him is what the Bible says he knew no sin he did not sin so these three aspects so Jesus Christ had flesh he became a man but his flesh was not sinful flesh but he became this likeness according to Philippians 2 verse 7 by becoming but of course he did not put on unclean garments or as Origen says his flesh was not termed sin but he was made sin at the cross he says that which gives the humanity of Christ this universal significance is simply and solely the Logos who united himself with it in vital unity. So um, you see that they have a divided Messiah and there is some kind of humanity that um, only has uh, universal significance because the Logos united himself with it and you'll see that that's actually the whole idea behind this that we can also have this spermaticos Logos so this sperm of reasoning in us and then when this becomes united with man then we become God man because we're just gonna kill the flesh and become partakers of the divine nature and we are little gods that's the philosophy behind it he it says, as the beginning, he is in the man whom he assumed. So in unbiblical term, uh, it's not true that the word of God assumed a man, but the word of God became flesh. And Origen was also a person that said that the soul was the connecting element between the Logos and the flesh, the humanity of Jesus, as he said. So quite clear, you see that this is a divided Messiah more like a avatar that was built out of Mary's womb flesh that was then moved around by some type of Logos person. Further it says sometimes the Logos is represented as the soul of the world which is broken up into a plurality of beings. This by itself would not sufficiently explain why the Logos should become a man, angel, and so forth, for in a certain sense he became man and angel by the creation of these beings. So here you see what you also find in the hypostasis of the Archons, which is an ancient Egyptian Gnostic uh, text, uh, that we are, uh, as parts of the soul of the world, entrapped in uh, this body. And I've heard free evangelicals say this more and more, uh, you know, like outside of church services, of course, but that they believe that our souls are eternal. And so you see this Gnostic teaching growing. And it comes from origin. For he is able to assume all because all are created by him and in them all is but one generic substance of different grades for there is but one Logos. 
so he also says that he became an angel for everybody and so forth he says that uh, he regarded the sacrifice of Christ on the cross as the sacrifice offered in the center of the world on behalf of the entire world it says here um, how important was the position held by that image of Christ in his totality in the system of Athanasius prior to the Arian controversy we have seen above. So Athanasius and then these Cappadocian fathers have built on Origen's understandings. So this pagan philosophy that we were warned about by Paul, as we will also see, we will look at it. Christianity's aim was the perfection of humanity. I don't think that that's true. Uh, the Bible says that Jesus Christ came to save sinners. That was the aim of Jesus Christ. We needed to be saved from eternal damnation. And his aim was not to deify mankind, as it says in pagan philosophy. By the assumption of a body... Uh, he was not humbled, uh, but deification became the portion of the body which he assumed. So this body uh, that was pre-created in the womb that he then took on, coming down here and took it on, he deified that body by the assumption, because they say whatever God touched, he has deified. So what would that mean? according to their philosophy, when you accepted Jesus in your heart, like they say, when he comes in you, when you have a relationship with him, you know, uh, do you become deified in their understanding and you just don't know it yet? He wrapped himself in our first fruits and married himself therewith. Taking this perishing man into himself, he renews him by a stable renewal unto eternal duration. For this reason, this union of the divine and human took place in him in order that with that which is by nature divine, he might unite that which is by nature human and the salvation and deification of the human might be firmly established. So there you go. It's all about deifying humans, you becoming a god-man, Gnosticism. Satanic, pagan, occultism is the pillar of the whole church system, and your branch is part of it, whether it is led by a John MacArthur who builds his theology on uh, these dogmas from Nicaea, Constantinople, and Chalcedon, whether it is a James White, um, you name it, all of those clubs and those free evangelicals and non-denominationals, Baptists, King James only, you name it, they all, UPCI, Oneness Pentecostals, all of those, though they might not believe in the Trinity, but they believe in this taking on, assuming a human nature out of the body of Mary. And this is actually the pillar of the whole cancer. That's why you don't hear uh, debates on it. That's why the UPCI has forbidden their ministers to even mention these topics. And they say it's a topic that brings division. That's how it's termed. That's why they're not allowed to preach about it. In fact, they uh, kicked out or, well, the history is a little more complicated, I guess, but you should study the history with Teclamerium. Uh, what happened in Ethiopia after Teclamerium found out that the word actually became flesh. Um, I'm not advocating for any church, not for the early Anabaptists, because Mano Simons also had a better understanding of the Incarnation, as did Teclamerium, but I think it's noteworthy that there is so much silence put on this. But you find it in these books this satanic Gnostic church doctrine of the hypostatic union. He regarded the work of redemption therefore as already begun with the act of incarnation 
And this you find also in the fall of Sophia myth from Pleroma to Canoma and then back up from Canoma to Pleroma that uh, the mere incarnating was an act of salvation already. Now the Bible says that we have been bought by the blood of Jesus Christ and that the word of God was slain at the cross. So the salvation was then further recognized by God through the resurrection. So the resurrection is what you have to believe in, in your heart. And then you have to confess with your mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord, meaning the one and only God of the Old Testament as his son that he brought forth. So the son of God, you actually have to believe in his resurrection and confess him to be Lord. Which is what these people don't do because they say the Old Testament God is called Jehovah, which the Dominican mystic Raymond Martini in 1270 has claimed in his work Puigi Fide. And um, it actually means God of mischief or destruction or ruin and um, Yahweh means he falls like lightning from heaven, which comes from Wilhelm um, Jesinius from the 1800s. And you can read the 1911 Encyclopedia Britannica on Jehovah, and you will find that it says in there that it's unimpeachable truth, the derivation of these names. And that's not God's name. God's name is Jesus. He is a savior. He's an eternal savior, as he's always been, and his name was revealed as Jesus said in John 17 and as God prophesied in Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 7 that he would do that like he said to Moses I shall become that I will become he became flesh that's his name Jesus the amen the right hand and power of God moving forward here we have a very important statement. Similar expressions occur repeatedly in the works of the two Gregories and of uh, Basilius. So, the Gregories, the two of them, they were two of these Cappadocian fathers who formulated the dogma of the Trinity at Constantinople. For he will continue united with the flesh which he has assumed until he shall have deified me by the power of the Incarnation. There you go, like I told you, the goal is to deify everybody, to make you a little God, and not to save your pitiful soul from eternal hellfire and conform you to the image of angels, like Jesus said. Actually, we're being conformed to the image of Christ. I don't want to use unbiblical language, but Jesus said when we're in heaven, we will be like the angels of God, not given into marriage. So I apologize if I have phrased that uh, in a wrong manner. I need to be very careful that I do not say anything, that I don't give any ammunition to enemies of Jesus Christ and the truth, because they like to isolate that, and then they say, see, see what this, this guy is saying? He doesn't know what he's talking about, but I very well know what I'm talking about. And I know this wicked church system. I've known it for a long time. I know how much of these people lie, that they have no sense of righteousness, and that most of them unknowingly are children of Satan. And they're, they're going to be doomed because God does not guide them into the truth because they do not go to God and ask him to reveal the truth personally through Bible study, even if it means that you abandon the church system, which demonstrably you have to do. I mean, you can buy this book and read it yourself. I'm on page 345 now. A more complete conception of the mediation of the representation of the entire race by the God-man could not be framed than the one given here. That's what the authors say. So if you read that, pages 333 or 332 until 345, then you know what these people believed. So it's not Andre Bentrop saying this. It's actually from the mouth of these wicked, satanic priests themselves who built the dogmas that you say are essentials. It says Athanasius did not hold Origen's doctrine that Christ became an angel for angels, but still he believed that the Incarnation had some sort of reference to them also. Spe uh, specially rich in passages of this kind are the works of Gregory of Nyssa. 
According to him, God, in uniting himself with one man, united himself with the whole of humanity. There you go. Assumed the entire race because the one man whom he assumed, and so forth and so forth. You'll see that this stuff is actually the basis of it, and it's satanic, pagan, Gnostic Christology. So, let's talk a little bit more about the truth then. I've prepared a little something. I apologize. I forgot that I already closed the folders, but I'm going to try to make this as brief as I can. I've talked about this before several times, but I just want to show you um, with some word explanations, and I'm going to pivot off of 1 Corinthians 15. Um, I advise you to read 1 Corinthians 15, but especially it talks about this new body that we're going to put on uh, at the return of Jesus Christ. And it says, when this corruptible has put on incorruption and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. So we're supposed to be safe from death and not to be deified while we're walking the earth because Christ assumed a body and by that way assumed humanity, all of it, and now whatever he touches becomes deified. That is a lie. Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? And now pay attention. 1556. The sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. The strength of sin is the law. One more time. The strength of sin is the law. The word of God has been used by the accuser. It says that, that Satan accuses us day and night before God. He does that using the law of God. That is the strength of sin and the sting of death is sin. So, moving on forward we are going to read uh, Colossians Colossians chapter 2 8 through 23 beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceit according to the tradition of man according to the basic principles of the world and not according to Christ for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power Here's a little hint. Study the word Godhead. You'll find that it doesn't have anything to do with an impersonal essence that three persons share and that this somehow is the God person. In him you were also circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, in which you also were raised with him through the faith in the working of God, through faith in the working of God, who raised him from the dead. So, we were circumcised with him by putting off the body of the sins of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, and this all happened because we were raised with him through faith in the working of God. So, the whole act was carried out by Jesus and we simply take hold of that by faith yeah it doesn't have anything to do with water baptism that you know like when we do that we're not sinning anymore and um, that you know like we're already putting on some resurrection body when we start believing in Jesus no by Faith, through faith in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. That's why you have to believe the resurrection. Romans 10 verse 9. That is so central that you understand this doesn't have anything to do with water baptism. I'm sorry, <laughs> dear uh, Ethiopian apostolics. That is a lie because we um, become righteousness by faith in the working of God. As it's laid out here in Colossians chapter 2. So, you being dead in your trespasses, and by the way, before I continue, let me just say one thing because of this buried with him in baptism. Baptism means overwhelming. So if you're overcome, overwhelmed by something, first of all, that is also baptism. It's, you can do a word search with water baptism, for example, and read a little bit about it, what the Bible has to say with these Strong's words. But you will see that Jesus also says that he had to be baptized with a baptism 
and that he was waiting for this to be accomplished. He says that in Luke, he came to th cast a fire on, onto the earth, and he himself had to be baptized with a baptism. So he uh, was, of course, talking about his crucifixion, his whole, um, his death, his uh, burial, his resurrection. That was, in, in essence, the baptism, the overwhelming. And in, in that um, act of Jesus Christ, through faith in the working of God, we have been given this righteousness already. So, you believe a fact that happened almost 2,000 years ago in order to have your soul saved. That's what this is talking about. You being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. How? So you see this again. When, you, when we were still sinners, Christ died for us, it says. So being dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him. So when was Jesus made alive? At the resurrection. So because we will receive his flesh later, this is why we can be saved and enter heaven. And this righteousness we can have through faith. And that's why we already have it. We have to just believe that this resurrection took place. That's the rules that God plays by. So it says, having wiped out the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he has taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross, having disarmed principalities and powers, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. So, and then it goes on to explain that that's why we shouldn't be judged for eating certain things anymore or not holding feast days and that, you know, they take delight in false humility and, um, you know, use uh, the, the things that have an appearance of wisdom and self-imposed religion. So the church system, that's what this talks about. And it's so important that you understand that you're being shown here that the word of God had to become flesh because it says that God actually wiped out the handwriting of requirements which was against us. And how did he do that? He took it out of the way and he nailed it to the cross. So this has to be taken literal because God disarmed principalities and powers that way. <clears throat> Just like we read in 1 Corinthians 15 that the power of sin was the law. So this uh, uh, armor... Uh, this weapon, this attack weapon, was now ineffective. <clears throat> so, let us go ahead here. I've taken a few screenshots before. Um, so, for example, the handwriting that was against us. That's the uh, uh, kerographon, and this word only appears once in the Bible. And it's actually a hand, yeah, Cairo graphon. So handwriting. It's a bond. Yeah, it's like a legal document. So it's the handwriting of decrees. And the, these decrees, that's the word dogma. Like you hear dogma in a church. Well, God has his own dogmas, which is the law of the Old Testament. It says that he wiped it away. And I also have this word here it means to obliterate to wash over to wipe off <clears throat> and in isaiah 43 25 in the septuagint it says god says actually i am i am he the one wiping away your lawless deeds because of me and your sins in no way shall i remember so it's been prophesied with the same word in the septuagint g1813 to wipe away the lawless deeds. How? By wiping away the against us handwriting by the decrees, by the dogmas. <clears throat> and so this was contrary to us, like I said. Um, and it says that he has lifted it 
from out of the midst, having fastened it with a nail to the cross. So this to lift something, to take it out of the way, huh? he took it out of the midst, but this to lift it means actually to raise something up. So just like Jesus was lifted up and nailed to the cross, it's expressed here in Colossians 2.14 that God lifted up the handwriting by decrees, which was contrary to us, and nailed it to the cross. Um, in 1 John 3 verse 5, it says that our sins will be lifted away by God. So, Jesus was made sin for us at the cross, but not because his flesh that he assumed was sinful or sin and there was darkness in him. That is untrue. Um, so this fastening with a nail is uh, a compound of two words like you see it here and it means to spike fast and in John 20:25, 20, it talks about the impression of the nails in Jesus' hands that um, doubting Thomas wanted to put his finger in. So it actually means to nail something. So it's not just figurative speech, but it's actual truth for those who understand that the Word of God became flesh. Um, it says then in Colossians 2.15, having divested, yeah, to strip, like when you strip off your clothes, um, to despoil, yeah, to uh, disarm. So disarm the sovereignties and authorities. He made an example in an open manner, triumphing over them by it. So um, this triumphing is also in Second Corinthians two fourteen. To God be favor at all times, causing us to triumph in Christ. Um, and so God stripped naked the sovereignties, the archis, yeah, like angels who didn't keep their own sovereignty in Jude 1 verse 6. Romans 3.38 says that, um, you know, nothing can divide us from Christ, not angels or life or sovereignty. So, in uh, further it says, he, so he stripped naked the sovereignties and the authorities. Yeah? So for example, in the two witnesses in Revelation 11, they have authority to lock the heavens. So people had this authority through God's law to pass us on to death because of the, the, that the, the power of sin was the law. Very important to understand this. This is how they had authority and God stripped them naked of it. He says he made an example, yeah, so he um, disgraced them, I believe it was, hold on. Yeah, he disgraced them. Yeah, it says in Job 26, 13 in the Septuagint, the bolts of heaven are in awe of him. So this being in awe is derived from the same word. So God made a disgrace of those sovereignties and authorities in an open manner, it says. You know, like in Proverbs 120, wisdom says uh, in the squares, in open places, she celebrates. So God's wisdom is on display for everybody to see at the cross. And Satan didn't like this. It says that they did not understand what God did. First Corinthians chapter 2 says they had known this they would not have crucified the Lord of glory so this incarnation that the Word of God became flesh was not understood by the devil to a degree that he knew what he was doing when he was crucifying and killing Jesus that this was actually stripping himself his authority himself of his authority, making him naked. So this weapon he cannot use, it's now passed on to us because the word of God was resurrected, glorified in heaven, ascended, and then poured out as a life-giving spirit. There you go, you have the New Testament, and now it's your weapon. Now you can attack with it and say, hold on, my righteousness is in what Jesus Christ did. Um, what happened on the cross? Just like I read it to you from Colossians 2. That's why you should understand all that I'm telling you here. 
and that it's so significant how you've been lied to by the church system and still are being lied to. Um, let me just tell you one last thing because this has a mirror expression here in the book of Ephesians where also this enmity and this enmity is actually the word of God. Um, if you don't believe that in Isaiah 63.10 um, it says they resisted persuasion meaning Israel and provoked uh, his Holy Spirit and the Lord turned against them for enmity he waged war against them so this word enmity G2189 is the same one that is used in Ephesians 2.15 the enmity and this talks about Jesus what he did he cleared this away the enmity of the law yeah? so nomos from a primary word law and then it says specifically of Moses so the Old Testament Word of God um, and then this clearing away means to render entirely useless so destroy so Jesus Christ by having been slain at the cross was the Word of God killed now don't forget the Word of God was resurrected you should never forget that so Jesus did not abolish the law in general but for us who have faith in the promise of God Romans 10 verse 9 if you believe the resurrection in your heart and confess that Jesus is Lord you will be saved because of this because the enmity by his flesh notice those words Zarki the Logos Zarx Igineto John 1 14 the Logos became flesh the enmity by his flesh of the law of commandments in decrease here again is your dogmas and these commandments uh, that he cleared away and then it says um, through the cross he killed the enmity and this literally means to kill um, so this is the gospel and when Jesus talks about eating his flesh it means reading the word and when it talks about drinking his blood it means believing because the blood is the soul so the soul of scripture believing those promises of eternal life that's drinking the blood that's what gives you life so if you just eat the flesh just read the Bible not enough that's what the Jews do that's what many people do you need to drink the blood you have to get down to the bottom to the soul of it and believe those promises of eternal life so now you heard the word became flesh gospel as I'm just gonna term it now um, is actually the gospel of the New Testament and I'm not gonna exchange that for some logos person that's number two in a triad that somehow assumed something where darkness was in there it was called sin and you know he kind of uh, united himself with us so that I can be deified I wouldn't have a problem with having a God for eternity that I can just hear from and lean on to and you know just receive from his words like it says in Psalms I don't want to be deified I'm okay uh, being a man that'll be glorified with an immortal body um, I'd be happy to go to heaven and spend time there <laughs> with God, but uh, my focus on earth is not to become a little God. I want to give witness to this that God has shown me, and I'm very thankful to God that he did. So, have a good night.